Okay, moving on to our topics for today. Ah, so topic one, um, and this is regarding um, modeling techniques and, and concept design working through the detail design or our detail model. Um, and and I saw Chris, yep, Chris is still on, so that's good to see. Um, so basically, I just wanted to go through the methodology that I've adopted um, to enable essentially a one model process um, for not, so it means you don't have to, have to throw out your model um, and starting from scratch again. So this is one of the things that I built up as a foundation to my workflows over a decade ago in 2013. Uh, and basically what this means is, is if you follow, there's certain steps you have to put in place to enable us to work successfully. And once again, you know, I'm, I'm keen to hear other people's views on this as well in terms of how they're, how they're either going well with this or struggling. But this is kind of the kind of rules behind how I've gone about this so I don't actually have to throw out my model, gain the benefit of having a model in place to then enable my design development to work effectively. So the key thing to note with this is that the out-of-the-box attributes don't cut it. Now, what I mean by this is, is that if you're relying on the out-of-the-box attributes, um, this methodology of modeling really doesn't work. And the reason why I say this is because it's not just about modeling, it's also about attaching uh, associative labels to everything um, throughout the process. And to this day, there is still a um, the webinar I delivered in 2013, or yeah, 2013, where I showed this whole process in a very detailed way with very bespoke labels. Obviously, ARCHICAD's moved forward a little bit over the last decade, but it hasn't moved forward enough uh, in some of these areas. Um, but the key thing is, is that you need to kind of have in place your own attributes to do this properly. Um, I know this is a hard thing for a lot of people, but accurate modeling from day one, uh, everything modeled so that you're actually working to real dimensions, okay? So don't go modeling things at 89 degrees and 89.9 .9 degrees. You've got to model things um, accurately dimensionally. Uh, and if you don't do so, um, what that will mean is that you'll end up with having to remodel everything. So you're not going to gain the benefits of utilizing your concept design model if you model inaccurately from day one. So it's a concept of kind of measuring twice and, and cutting once in terms of you know construction. And I, my thoughts are is that I know that when we're working on concept design models, we're, we're rushing to get the design done so that the client can see it. And we're always trying to do things on the run which is kind of stressful uh, and and the like. But if you just take that little bit of extra time, what it actually does is it saves you oodles of time um, moving into design development. Now, what I propose as a workflow, and this kind of acts not only as a workflow so that you're focusing purely on the spaces and form, but what it means is, is that if you actually set up attributes for an LOD 200 kind of modeling, which is essentially what you end up with a concept design model, uh, it means that you kind of put yourself in a position where you're not fixated on what attributes are associated with an element when you're modeling. Uh, you're more interested in the, uh, the architectural spaces and forms, which is, from my perspective as an architect, the most important part at the start. So going back to kind of the idea of you know how the out of the out of the uh, how the out of the box attributes don't cut it you need a full attribute list for LOD 300 modeling and basically the approach that I've taken for that is have building materials surfaces and cut fills to represent all of the products and materials that I specify uh, on my projects now this is my methodology for concept design modeling, and, and I'm sure that other people might approach this slightly differently. Um, but in concept design, as an architect, my uh, interest is actually purely on um, focusing on space and form. Yes, there is some materiality that kind of define kind of the space and the architecture we're trying to create, but 
predominant focus at that point in time is on space and form. So I don't want to be bogged down on going, is this going to be plasterboard? Is this going to be FC? Is this going to be carpet or timber? Um, the focus, obviously, going back to accurate modeling is making sure our model reference line position is where it needs to be. And once again, this comes back to model quality assurance. So when you're modeling, make sure you take the time to get your model reference line in the right spot. Um, you don't want to find yourself going through design development and having to take the elements that you've put in place and, and readjust them to suit um, because you just were kind of a little bit lazy with your model reference lines. Now, model reference lines, depending upon the project type that you're working on, can be very, very important with regards to calculations of areas with, with zones and placing of zones. In an ideal world, you place your reference lines based upon your project type and, the, and, and how area calculations need to be made. So, for example, here in Australia, the Australasian Health Facility Guidelines have very complicated um, methods of measurement in terms of inside of the external wall, the, um, the outside of the internal wall to a corridor, and the center line between adjoining rooms. So it means that your reference lines sit in all different spots, and that's based upon area calculations and, and the like. So depending upon your project type is how you need to work with your reference lines. And yes, sometimes it takes a little bit longer to get your model down in concept design because you're sitting there and remembering how, you, how, you, how your reference line needs to position itself. But I'm telling you right now, it's the best thing you can do in terms of setting yourself up for success um, moving into the next phase. Now, in concept design, I only work with two building materials in total. Um, I have two building materials in place. One is generic existing. Uh, and 99.9% .9 of the time, uh, any existing material from an existing building um, would be this material because that's all it is. It, is, it isn't unless you've gone in and been able to determine how the full wall's been structured or a whole slab's been structured, by keeping it that at that generic existing level, it means you're not taking liability for saying exactly what that's actually made of. So it's actually kind of a, a good methodology um, for modeling and demonstrating to you know people that you're sharing your model with um, that you, yes, it might be concrete, but you don't know exactly what it actually is. And then generic proposed. So every element that's new is given that building material. And the reason for that, once again, as we're going back to talk about focusing on space and form and not being fixated on what, what a building is made of specifically. And the key to this also is in terms of getting your areas right, you know, model your zones correctly. Um, if you model your zones correctly, um, Ideally, say you're following perimeters of walls so then they can be updated accordingly. It's so much easier than manually um, modeling your zones um, in terms of getting the right outcomes. Now, this is a video all the way back from um, my Fulton Trotter days that I presented at uh, the Key Client Conference at Graphisoft in Budapest in 2014. And the key thing about this is talking about the model progression. So back in the day, I actually set up um, a model on the left hand side which is a concept design model which was based upon um, certain um, two building materials and then you upgraded it as you needed to so you can see over on on this right hand side we have complex profiles for the foundations we have composites for the for the floors and the walls and then what we're basically built up was this in over the top um, set of building materials and surfaces to enable um, the practice to meet the needs of essentially 10 uh, directors at the time or 10 associates at the time. But the idea is, is that what you want to be able to do is update rather than actually replace and start from scratch. Now, in terms of detailed design, this is the kind of process that I take. So the focus actually shifts from spaces and form to how it's actually constructed. So that's kind of where my mindset shifts from from the start. Then 
the next step is basically I sit down and think from a specification standpoint what materials and products are going to build this building. Now, a lot of people I know and, and from the traditional mindset of construction, sadly, they write the specification at the end of the project. Um, whereas my approach to delivering projects is at the start of design development, I actually sit down and actually kind of write my specification right then. Because then what that does, um, having my specification sitting there and being written, uh, it means that I, as I'm making decisions on my project, the specification is actually building itself. And I have a base specification that's set up for all of my projects so, and half of the more 80% of the products are already filled in and completed. So it means that because I have a standard palette of materials and products I use on every single project, I don't have to reinvent the wheel with my specification. It's already written there for me. So it means that, you know, later on today, we're going to talk about standard detail libraries. I've never taken the standard detail library approach. I've taken the standard specification approach um, and standard documentation approach to all of the products and finishes that I have on my project. So hand in hand with um, sitting down and resolving the specification, it'll either be hand details um, that inform the modeling. And, you know, there's, it's kind of funny. I still have yellow trace. I sit there and I will print things out and I sit here with my notebook and, and, and doodle sketches and detailing out. Um, or some days I'll sit down and actually just sit in a, in a blank worksheet um, or overlay a section and sit down and resolve, resolve details in Archicad. So there's multiple ways in which you can do it. But the idea is, is that once you've determined those materials and products, once you've kind of hand detailed out how the building goes together, it then actually informs the modeling and then composites and complex profiles get created to actually replace um, the generic model, I guess you could say, which is, is in place specifically for, you know, communicating the concept design. And then obviously, as we move forward, the engineering gets added to the model, which then enables it all to be coordinated. And then you kind of adjust things as it's as needed. So moving into kind of a demonstration mode, and we'll just switch over into Archicad. And I don't know. I've had a little one. This is the whole problem with uh, um, having a public holiday in Brisbane. We end up with um, our little ones coming and asking us questions with notes that we can't read or understand. But um, in this model, what we'll see here is I've just modeled a standard, really ugly building. Um, one day I should set up a, a nice architectural style project for this um, to enable... Um, better communication that it comes with a bit of architectural style so we don't get bored by it. But um, what you'll see here is I've modelled my walls in place here with a non-composite face. It's just a, a native element. Um, this template actually has in place, the one I actually have in place at the moment has a lot more in it. It actually kind of enables you to actually um, set things up and this is set up correctly. Um, so it's set up so that I actually have in place um, building materials for master planning. So essentially LOD 100. Then I have two building materials that I'll use for um, LOD 200 work. So you can see here that's where my cut fill comes in, the proposed and existing. Um, as many people have heard me talk about over the years, the methodology of I have adopted in my template um, to enable us all to tie to one another, as you'll see that I actually have, apart from uh, our, one, our 100 series, I have in place uh, building material surfaces and cut fills to match name by name. So you'll see here, these are all in place. And once again, these are generic proposed 200. Then I come into trade. So I've got a trade based specification and all of these are tied to one another. Now the reason for this is so that you can model utilizing native elements or objects and get the same scheduling out. So we talk about scheduling later. Uh, one of the limitations within Archicad is scheduling. 
uh, elements properly. So we need things to tie all of these things together. Um, but the idea is, is that we go from only using two items, which then I can show you how we then filter it later. Um, these items here are kind of in place as kind of placeholders for presentation materials that won't ever get scheduled, but we want them to appear nicely uh, for you know our presentation models. And then we then transition them over into real building materials that represent um, product selections in a specification. So that's the kind of key thing with this. So real bland model. Um, now the ability also where we have these walls, uh, and I will just ungroup these. We can come in here and override surfaces. And as we talked about, and I'm just losing it behind other palettes right now, so I'll just move this over here. Uh, we do have our 3D. And I can tell you right now that having the uh, the search functionality in, in ARCHICAD 26 and then the new search functionality in 27, I don't, I actually, I've actually struggled with folders. I actually don't like them at all. And I've number, several people have heard me say that before. But what that means is that for concept design, we can set up 50 different overrides so that our model looks the way we want it to look um, for presentations if we'd want it to be more than just white. Um, so I'm just going to undo that. But as you can see here, we've got some slabs in place. We've got some walls in place. We've got some columns in place and we've got some roofs in place. Um, all native elements, all generic proposed. Now the first thing that I've I set up in my um, template and it's built out of my auditing section of my template is to identify what elements in the model are generic proposed. So when you're doing design development, what you want to actually be able to do is to go through uh, the model before you go to tender and make sure that all of the generic proposed elements have been replaced with uh, elements or essentially materials or composites that actually represent um, materials or products that are actually going to be part of the building. Any generic proposed that's left means that it's a decision that hasn't been made yet. Well, the decision may have been made, but that hasn't been applied to the model, which is essentially the, the communicator of the information and the design. So basically... Um, the approach we've taken is our reference line on the X outside face. And what we're going to do, and I'll just turn on our group functionality again, and we'll have our external walls all selected. Let's convert this to a composite. And here's a composite I've made earlier. Um, not very happy with the... Let's turn on our colours. And we'll turn off the true line weight. Now, the challenge with this is, is that when a builder goes to build it, they're not going to offset the inside of the wall by 9 millimeters. So what I need to do is I'll go back, select all the walls again, and convert this to core outside. Now, several people I know in the past, and some a process we tested at Fulton Trotter at one stage, was is we actually ended up with a generic um, composite to start with, which meant we didn't have to change from core, or sorry, outside face to just core outside. So it meant that when you placed um, a new composite, you basically placed composites to start the project off uh, and then replaced them with um, known composites. But then it meant that core outside, if that was where your reference line sat, could be maintained. Uh, and then what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to come along and change these to my internal walls. Um, then we'll see some issues here where our reference lines haven't gone where, they, where they're supposed to. Looking here, you can see here, once again, I've made the mistake, outside face, rather core outside. And uh, it's interesting seeing how our plasterboard continues through. So we'll pull that back. Unbelievable. So there's little challenges we face with this software every day, don't we? But let's tidy it up a little bit better. Obviously, we get those things there. But coming to our slab, I know that I want concrete and I'm going to type 2, and I'll use, I'll basically nominate my concrete um, types based upon finishes. So for example, our internal concrete slab, I would like it to be a um, slab that is um, uh, steel trail finished. 
whereas the external slab, I want that to be um, brim finish, so I can cover off on that. Um, we'll come into our column here, and I don't know what I've got up my sleeve with these. I don't have any of those in place, but I can maintain that as a uh, structural steel. We'll go to structural steel, hot dip galvanized, and I now know that it's like a um, a one set one fifty column. The engineer's given me some some favourable outcomes with our column, so I've been able to shrink that down to its actual material. We'll jump upstairs real quickly, and uh, we've got that's my ceilings because I've got all of the layers on. I'll turn this into concrete. So in this instance here, that's a ceiling. Uh, in this instance here, I've got a challenge where I just modelled a single slab. It's very lazy because it was concept design. We'll minus that out. Drop downstairs or grab another one of these. And drop that in place. We'll grab all our external walls. Very quickly change those over as well. Core outside. Uh, nothing better than landing on a section. And we'll just switch these over as well. Be interesting to know how other people are working with this and whether or not they're doing a similar approach. Um, I'm going to update my ceilings as well. So my internal ceilings, I'm just going to change that to uh, no, plasterboard. And we'll just make that general 10 mil. So then we'll change that to 10 millimeters. We'll come out and we'll find our generic prop. Actually, we'll leave that in place. And we'll go into our into our audit schedule. Um, so we'll go into 3D. And we'll start to see some of these things starting to change. Um, so visually I can see here that all of these walls um, haven't been updated. Um, I'll just leave those for the time being. Uh, we can see here our column hasn't been updated. Um, but what we'll do is we'll go into our audit. And you can see here that we do still have a few um, items that are generic and the positive is and this when this actually works well um, we can actually use this the search functionality out of our schedule to actually go to it and see it and observe it I'll go in and I'll update it and outside core which means it'll all line up which is nice um, then I'll go back to that schedule see how our walls have started to tidy up we'll go in and there's two internal walls we only want them to be plasterboard, so we'll change them to wall type 2. Core outside. Everyone's awfully quiet this morning. But you can see here I've now tidied all those up. Let's go and find our slab that's internalised. I haven't updated that yet, so I'm going to make that one was going to be my concrete in situ type 1 because it was internal. We've got one more slab here that isn't. That's our ceiling. So that one was going to be uh, Safit. So this will be Safit Type 1. And I know it's not going to be 50 mil thick. It's only going to be going to be 9. Which then means that we have to come in and make some adjustments to our model. And that's the key thing in terms of knowing how you're modelling. Any changes you're going to need to make to your model to get it to work and tidy up. So we've tidied those up. Now I've just got my roof and my column. So we'll go and tidy that up as well. But basically this is the methodology that uh, I've adopted. Once you made decisions, you come along, you make the changes and adjust them to suit. Now I've only got my roof. And now today there's obviously, you know, we're not going to sit here and model you know, the, the full structure of a roof. Um, and I don't want to be that. Oh, we could just be lazy. We'll know that the roof thickness is going to be 16 millimetres. Uh, no, sorry, wrong one. 16 millimetres on the incline. Uh, and I'm going to go metal roof sheeting type 1. Um, so then that sets that all up. Now, it's not perfect in the sense of, you know, we do know that there's going to be several other elements in there that needs to make that roof up. So it's a feet, um, roof structure, faces, etc. But overall, uh, we find ourselves in a position where we now have 
the model transitioned. Um, all of the lines are tidied up uh, and all of the materials in place as we see fit. Um, so that's kind of, I guess, that. Any questions on that at all um, before we move on to the next section? Todd uses generic material to start design for all and then change when I know setting walls to grids during layout like the schedule for checking to see what needs to update. Yeah, it's it's definitely a, um, a, a good process to get involved in. Um, specifically, it works not as an individual, as a sole trader, as someone doing things by yourself. It's actually not so desperate, if you know what I mean, in terms of having to run this very strict um quality assurance approach um to how you how you kind of go about delivering it but when it comes to uh working in a team of people and you have uh, you know multiple people in the in the in the project working on the same thing it's really good to help communicate between team members what has been resolved and what hasn't been in the model and from my mind i think that's really really important so moving on to topic two um and finisher schedules um and so sam Parrish asked about this um now once again i want to go on about how out of the box um, attributes don't cut it and i know this is kind of going to sound um a bit parrot like but it's a, it's an approach i've been using for over a decade now so i kind of think that i don't no one's presented to me any other methodologies that work any better for attaching associative information to elements and I know Archicad properties can be part of this, but they're not as good from my perspective. Always got to have the fuel, the good Red Bull fuel. Um, so you really need to create surfaces that represent um, the finishes and material, the finishes you want to apply to elements. And what I went through before um, with creating all the materials, I'll quickly show you kind of one of the schedules that I have in place to show all the materials and products that I have in the project. So I will apply only a finisher schedule um, for elements that need a finish on top of the product itself. So for example, if I have a rock wall um, or I have a blockwork wall that is natural finish, you know, for say, there's no need to have a finisher schedule to say that the block wall is a block wall or the rock wall is a rock wall um, because I've already specified what that rock is. Typically, I'll use a finishers um, schedule um, or actually even another approach with um, floor finishes or wall vinyls or wall tiles. They all get modelled separately so they actually get scheduled as items, as elements themselves rather than actually having a separate finish to them. So typically, the only finisher schedule I have left on my project of, are typically relating to uh, metal finishes. Like, so for here in Australia, we have Color Bond, and there's 26, I think, Color Bond, or now they have the matte range, so I think it could be up to 30, uh, and paint finishes. But every other kind of element's covered in another schedule now. Um, so the way in which we need to do this is through utilizing the surface schedule. Um, the key thing with surface schedules and depending upon how, um, what can I say, how, how how you want to filter it, because the sad thing is, is that, you know, if you want to do an external finisher schedule versus an internal finisher schedule, and you don't want the internal finishes appearing on the external finisher schedule, there are some major challenges with uh, getting that to, to filter correctly. Um, there is one ability to use your IFC properties in terms of location and or position, which is either external or internal, but that doesn't work so well when you have a wall um, that is an external wall and you have, you know, cladding on one side and you have a standard paint finish on plasterboard on the other. It's very, very difficult to be able to break those up. Now, there is the ability to potentially also utilize Archicad properties. So you can say which elements, you can apply a property to an element and say what schedule you don't want it to appear in. You know, we'll give it a true false statement. 
Um, and that's something I've tested in the past. Um, but overall, I've kind of given up because I don't, because the template I have now is only kind of tied to paint finishes uh, and color bond. It means I can kind of very tightly refine my schedules. And I guess it'd be interesting, Sam, to see what challenges you're facing with regards to this so that we can, you know, maybe target and provide you the right answers, I guess. Um, so in terms of finisher schedules, um, let's jump back into Archicad. And I've done a good job here. I've got my fiber cement sheeting on the outside um, and I've got my plasterboard on the inside. Now, inbuilt, actually, and here we go. We've got a color bond roof as well. Okay, so that's the other key thing. So let's work with a couple of different things. We've got a color bond roof and we want to paint the internal walls and the external walls. So we're covering off on both of those items. Now, I've just gone out of the box here and I've set up a schedule, um, which I is just element type, 3D types. And I was lazy and I pulled a different schedule out. So this is kind of a schedule, all the different schedules I have buried in my, in my template. Um, and what I've done here is I've gone 3D types, renovation status is new, surface name contains either paint or color bond. Uh, because of the way in which I have structured my template. Now, I think that's correct. Yep. Now, right now, people go, well, what, why have I got paint 26 sitting here? Um, guess what that's done? It's picked up the grid. So one of the first things I should do is either A, change how my grid is appearing. Um, which would be probably the smartest thing, right? Um, which I could go back to generic black. And then what will happen is that that will now disappear off the schedule. Or the other approach being is, say, for example, it's an element type that I need to have it looking like that and I want it to have that paint finish. Then you can come into here and we can add a criteria element type is not <clears throat> and we can come down to more and we'll see grid element so there's other approaches and I don't know how often people are using these schedules to see um, where we have and statements you just continue on we have an or statement where it needs to be a criteria of several different types um, you need to utilize brackets. So basically you put a bracket in front of the first statement that ties to an or, and then the last statement that re refers to an or. Okay, so there's lots of challenges in this, and you get confused sometimes as to why it won't work. But um, we can go in now uh, into our model, and we'll take all of our external walls, and we're going to override the surface because that's how we would like to apply it. Um, and let's kind of go for a Melbourne theme today. We'll go for our paint finish five. Now, one of the things you want to also do is you want to kind of always end surface override using adjoining walls um, so that it tidies it up. Uh, and we will do the same for all of our external walls. We're going to make them all paint finish five. Oh, and I was lazy there. I could probably show why that works differently. Um, we don't want to be as oppressive in these recesses. So let's um, change them to paint finish two. Now what happened there was because it picked up that wall, it didn't like that. So I didn't change it. So you got to be very mindful as well. Into my suffete here. I want to paint off my suffete. So my bottom surface. Now typically in my projects, what I'll actually do, these are obviously very generic in their appearance. Um, but what I will do is I'll go and get the Dulux colors and apply them across each of my um, 
see here what we got there's a nice little problematic appearance here where this is not doing what we need it to do so let's lift this up and that's turn the grouping off no that's fine so this is just coming down into getting into your detail modeling the way we want it to look now we can see here at the moment that this feet's not coming out to this line now because our feet is going to be more powerful than uh, the wall's going to be more powerful than this 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 feet we're not going to want to do that so I'll cheat because this model's only going to be to a reasonable level of accuracy it's not going to be like miller millimeter perfect with some things with our feet sometimes I will cheat even though we want our cladding to come over the edge uh, and what we'll do is we'll override that with paint finish 5 here I'm trying to promote best practice modeling and cheating at the same time um, so what we have in place we have our paint finish 2 paint finish 5 and paint finish 1 we'll come into our finisher schedule and you can see here how nice that all looks now one of the challenges we face is, is that when we look in this in elevation uh, we'll go back a step when we look at this in elevation um, and obviously things have all been set up beautifully right now um, but let's just go to our settings and let's go to set this all up all right now say for example we have our cladding here and we want our cladding to have uh, a essentially the, the sheet layout as part of it so it's really really important and this is where your kind of paint colors will duplicate sometimes um, so if we go to our paint finish 5 uh, what we actually want here is we need to actually come in and pick our our sizes of our um, of our layouts for our, our panels and there's our cladding panels so we will do I don't know, let's do some weatherboards so now that has its weatherboard look um, so it's very important to remember that you need to obviously not only have potentially color representation if you want to do your colored elevations um, with your vectorial hatching um, or pull it back to um, pull it back to a lighter or you can even turn it off altogether really but I'm getting becoming more and more of a fan where I'm not using the ultra dark colors um, to actually um, to actually kind of use colored elevations I think that they're I find them a bit more interesting um, but then we have our schedule which is created um, what I need to do now is I'll need to come into our model and override our two roof sheets uh, I'll come in here with color bond and let's go because we want to make this house a hot box so you can see in here um, I have three for each type of color bond one's flat which you use for the edges of the sheet and I either have a custom orb or a trim deck finish so it's saying essentially what each of those finishes are so we'll go color bond 14 and that's flat and we'll type in cb14 and we'll get custom orb on the bottom now the problem with this is in an awfully dark model today um, is that what we end up with is we end up with both of those in play so what we can do also is filter out um, you know exclude let's actually do that again so surface name does not contain flat so it means that you can apply surfaces to elements but not have them appear in your schedule so that's what I've done there so now I've kind of created the filtered list of both the finisher schedule and 
essentially painted my project. So I've taken the DD model, uh, which is all modeled with all the property, the properties in terms of the actual materials, and created the finish schedule. Now there's another approach that I take here um, with regards to. Uh, so the funny thing is, is my approach to modeling, I, I model everything um, natively, so without composites, um, except for walls. So you can see here I have two different schedule types. I have a component um, one, where is, where is it is? Here we go, material product schedule for walls. So we open that all up, and you can see here I've got my fiber cement cladding, my plasterboard, and my timber wall framing. And then if I go up into my material schedule and all elements except walls. So you can see here, and we'll just make this a little bit bigger. So we've got our suffete, our concrete types, our plasterboard, our metal roof sheeting, our structural steel. So that together, these schedules here tie together to create the full specification for a project uh, because these codes are the product types in the specification and the specification gets written off the back of this or you know either or informing and i haven't seen many people sadly in my time actually utilize um, these methodologies um, as well which is kind of sad uh, all right now moving on to yeah um so Sam's just written into the chat, obviously, is looking about how he could get internal finisher schedules, um, tying it to the rooms. Um, the sad thing with that is I've never, ever written any of the manual finishes into the zone tool. Uh, sadly, the, at the moment, the only thing the zone tool picks up is objects. Um, so there is the potential, possibly, where you could actually use um i think like there's the linings tool which or it's a kind of wall accessory tool um which is an object where you could potentially schedule the finishes off that um but it's it's funny because it's been a very 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 long-term wish uh from clients customers archicad users across the world and it's one that still comes up in conversations today every time i have chats with with the team in budapest so, sadly, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So sadly, Sam, it's uh, it's not kind of driving. Uh, it's it's not there yet, and I can't remember on the roadmap if I've seen it or not. So, um, and I'm yet to sit down and have a really good conversation about some of these other issues that aren't on the roadmap yet, which. Hopefully, it can be a conversation that can happen sooner rather than later. Um, so Benji's asked, how do you manage wall framing, wood and metal stud framing for modeling um, accurate models? Um, really good question. Um, one of the things I came across, and I'll just jump back into my file, and I will just drive quickly to uh, my building materials. And we'll just go to frame, uh, what's going to be framing. Okay. So the problem we have at the moment is you can't model, or you can if you actually use add-ons, you can actually model individual studs. I'm never going to have an interest in modeling individual studs. Um, but you can't apply two materials over the same zone or area. Um, so... What I did within my project's templates, I have uh, essentially set them up so that they are either a still, you know, they represent what they're supposed to be, but then I have an additional building material for um, framing with thermal insulation, framing with acoustic insulation. Um, same thing with wall framing. So I have steel wall framing, steel wall framing with thermal, steel wall framing with acoustic. Then I'll have um, timber wall framing. So basically I'm breaking it up uh, where the timber wall framing will be what it is. 
um, as the architect, I'm not responsible for the sizing of the wall framing itself. So off the basis of what the structural engineer advises as to whether the studs can be, you know, 70, 90, 120, 140s, um, then I'll size them appropriately. And the thickness of those studs then will go out. I'll model them accurately, uh, millimeter accurately in my composites, which, you know, can drive some people nuts. Um, so if we go into our composites here, uh, all I'll do is I'll set that up so that, you know, if it's 9 millimeters thick, it's 9 millimeters thick. If it's 13 millimeters thick, it's 13. Um, if we were to do this with metal studs, metal studs are obviously different sizes. So uh, steel, wall framing with thermal. Um, this becomes 88 millimeters, I think, from memory. It's been a while since, or 89 or something. Um, and then what's sad here is that all of this is in black and white at the moment. So we'll just close out of here. Um, I very much prefer working with my colored, uh, um, colored views because I actually can see the material. So I've actually got all of my um, pen sets set up to represent the Australian standard for the colors that they represent. So you can see here, uh, plasterboards in pink, timber framing is in blue, steel framing, oh sorry, steel framing is in blue, timber framing is in yellow. And what this means really quickly uh, means you can see what the product, the project is without any worry. Um, and it also means, say for example, we go into section, concrete's green as it's designed to be out of that standard. Um, but what it means then is that I can control everything uh, at an individual level. So now I can see how it's actually going to appear. My steel wall framing, I can come in and I can change it from my timber to my steel framing, uh, which is my, uh, this is the cut line, so that it'll actually appear properly. So that's, um, Benji, that's how I'm doing it. Um, yeah, Ricky's saying, we go to the designs, could take, detect the service. Yep. Um, no, sadly, <laughs> it's it's not going to happen in the near future uh, from from the knowledge that I have and the conversations. You know, the key thing is, um, everyone's obviously seen um, the ArchiCAD 7 or ArchiCAD 27 um, uh, thing through the building together. So they gave us a, a view. If you look at the roadmap, uh, relevant to that release, you see some of the products in that kind of that front section were essentially framed as kind of being very close to being developed. Um, I haven't been told what's in ArchiCAD 28, so therefore I'm kind of can, can speak. Um, but the idea would be is that you kind of look at the items that are closer to the to that kind of being developed phase rather than in, in future investigation. That's possibly what could come in future releases. So I haven't seen it. Um, Ricky says for composites, what part do you typically set to other? Um, I am a bit lazy. Um, I use core or finish. Um, I model air spaces in my composites. I actually model my sarking. Um, even though sarking is only 0.2 a millimeter thick, I'll model my sarking as a millimeter thick and reduce my air space by a millimeter. Um, so it's kind of, um, I always put those things in because once again, I'm not thinking of my model um, to make it pretty for me as an architect. I'm thinking of it from the future perspective. And this is the whole thing about developing standards and modeling early on um, so that once it's handed to a quantity surveyor, the quantity surveyor can actually take that and use it to actually deliver projects in terms of estimates from it. Um, there's also the ability to export an IFC now. So each of the individual pieces of a composite can be exported as individual um, elements or kind of sub elements, which then can enable um, construction scheduling to occur. So it means that they can actually pull your model apart. So it's really, really important, I think, um, that when you're thinking about how you work, it's not just about how you're working today. It's about how people are going to use your model in a few years' time how how actually it ties to everything and the reason why i'm doing all that is because it i can automatically generate um all of my wall type schedules so a builder can be handed 
um, a, a, a floor plan and a set of details. It says, you know, wall type one. Wall type one is made up of all of these pieces. So therefore, when they're on site, the different tradespeople that contribute to building that wall know what elements go into it. So if we didn't model sarking, it wouldn't come up as part of the wall. So they're not going to put sarking in, they might forget. Sam says, interestingly, the zones can pick up surfaces from walls that are touching, but they can't seem to do anything with that info. Yeah, it's, once again, it's about, it's about the program doing so many different things and it can't do everything, sadly. Um, all right, final topic three. Um, and this is a, a request from Mark Howard. Um, standard detail libraries. Now, there's a couple of approaches you can take with this. Um, I personally haven't ever set up a standard detail library. It hasn't been my focus um, because normally the, um, when I've worked on projects, a lot of the things I do are very bespoke uh, on a project-by-project -project basis. Um, and when I was at Fulton Trotter, we talked about it for over a decade to set one up. But the problem is with so many people doing things so so differently, it meant that it never occurred. But for those that actually work consistently and use details, similar details on, on, on projects, I guess this is highly relevant to you. Now, there's a couple of different ways in which we can approach this. So you have individual details placed on worksheets or details that you link to a source marker. So you place a marker in, in your project and then you can then link that worksheet or that detail directly to this, um, which means that it's sitting there in your template ready to go. It gets linked up and away you go. Um, another approach is, is that you could have sheets of standard details. So you can have them grouped into sheet format with sheets all set up and placed in your documentation set already um, because you might have those standard details on every single project. And from my mind, uh, a lot of structural engineers take that approach. They will have standard details, you know, how many times do you see standard timber framing um, details on every single project that they um, provide you? Um, and then also you can go about the approach where they're grouped into detail types. Um, so you might have, you know, cladding and um, cladding details. You may have joinery details. You may have skirting details, cornice details, bulkhead details. Um, you know, light track details that you might use on every single project, handrail details, stair details. Um, you could group them into detail types. They could either be individual details or and that are copied to source markers, once again. Um, I'm going to go into the negatives and pros and cons about these afterwards, um, but then it'd be good to also hear from people from their perspective as well, what they think um, as well. Then um, we can take the standard detail library as a separate file. So you could take the approach that you copy and paste individual details from your separate file. Uh, you could have external linked view um, for individual or page of details. So you can actually link that view um, onto your layout book. Um, you could have details saved as DWGs or and placed as external views. Or you could have details saved as PDFs uh, and saved as external views. Um, another approach you can take um, would be to kind of place them on a floor plan on, on stories and then you'd be able to module them in. So you'd be able to mod them in or save them as mods or publish them as mods. All right, so they're kind of the different ways in which I believe you can go about those things. Um, kind of moving into um, the pros and cons. So um, if you maintain details in your template, Let's look at a few of these things. So the first thing we have is there's no attribute issues. Um, there's been some recent um, videos produced, I think from Jared Banks or Shoe Name, where he talks about challenges of uh, master GDLs and the like. Uh, we have scenarios, if you're updated your template or pulling a detail that doesn't have the same attributes with their index numbers as the file you're copying them into, um, you'll end up with the fills or lines appearing differently to what they're supposed to, which um, we want to try and avoid by having them in your template. It's really easy um, to make minor edits um, to your detail. And the key thing about this is on a per project basis. So by being in your template, you can make edits to that, um, that detail 
to align specifically to your project and not be tied to um, a global you know global answer to all of it the challenge is um, if you have too many standard details it actually can add lag to your project where details aren't used so the key thing being is, is there's no point in having anything extra in your file that isn't needed um, a lot of people one of the things that I find when I audit people's projects is is that they have so much extra stuff in there um, from earlier phases now before we talked about the conversion I guess from concept design to design detail design or detail modeling or DD or and CD um, at the end of each phase always save off a PLA file of your project and then once you're in design development the whole layout book that you have in place for concept design delete it the views you have saved for concept design, if you're not using them for design development, delete them. Um, the more, the less you have in the file, as you add more detail in, you, it makes your file run smoother. Um, and then there's this challenge where you have this scenario where you have multiple details um, on a worksheet um, and then the need to manually name them uh, on your layout sheets which I kind of find a bit more frustrating. Um, I personally am a fan of having individual details. Um, one thing that was really, really important that I don't I haven't actually written off into this in this presentation today, but um, for those that are using BIMX quite frequently, um, if you use a standard detail library and your details are sitting at zero, zero in virtual space, um, if you link that to a source marker from Archicad and you try to use it in BIMX, the really nice thing about detailing where or placing details where they are in virtual space or where they've been cut is that when you overlay um, the drawing over the 3D models cut in BIMX, it actually sits where it's supposed to. Uh, whereas we did a test several years ago where we had a, a project 550 meters up in the air and we had a standard detail from another project that sat at zero zero and what that meant was is that the detail was not sitting relevant over the top of um, over the top of where it was occurring in real life so how frustrating is that so it's once again best practice um, in terms of placing details and, and the issues um, so standard detail libraries in an external template. So the positive is, is it reduces waste where details aren't used. So you're not actually loading this all up into your project. Um, you're only putting in what you need. Um, I actually think that the DWG and the PDF method is actually really good for locked in details. So you actually just drop in and drop in your PDFs or DWGs to, then they're graphically gonna appear the way you want them to, um, but they only work when they're locked in, okay? Um, DWG PDF not good where minor edits are required and I think and then, and then the other thing is is that say for example you want to make an edit to the view from an external file that's then going to change that detail to all of the projects that you've um, loaded that file in that view into so that's another challenge where that detail has to be standard standard it can't be standard and make adjustments then there's the challenge uh, and the potential of attribute issues so that's one of the things that we've got to be very mindful of and we don't want to, um, if you're working in this methodology, you've got to think of those and understand those challenges. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of the key thing. So Benji's asked, um, how do you manage your time so you can be precise and detailed with these projects causing uh, managing information? Sometimes took too much time. Uh, this can be a problem with delivery time. Um, so really good question. Um, because I'm being precise with the attributes and modeling, uh, means my notation time is reduced. Because I'm fi focusing on the whole project and not just Archicad, so my fixation or focus overall on a project is about the time it takes to produce all information. So it's not just about Archicad and drawings, it's about specifications, it's about schedules. And by taking the approach of modeling, I'm actually getting a lot more for free. Uh, by taking such a rigorous approach to 
my attributes and and the way in which that works it means that i can label a whole drawing uh in record time so yes i'm taking a bit more time and care to actually model things correctly but what it means is, is that on an elevation i can go through and um so right now i've got a, a residential extension project um it's probably all up maybe eight hundred thousand dollars worth and i can go through and label and notate all of my elevations and sections and i'm talking a project with um, eight sections four elevations i can um, notate that whole project all of them in probably two to three hours um, whereas in the past uh, i'd have problems with that and, and in terms of how long it takes and then what happens when things change and this is the other thing the insurance policy i like to buy right is that if an element or a product changes um i don't have to go back and change any of my labels because all my labels are associated to once what i've modeled if i go and change the finish automatically all of my labels update and on all of my drawings i have interactive schedules so that all of my schedules and my drawings will automatically update as well well actually i lie my drawings don't automatically update because I have everything set to manual update. <laughs> um, the reason I have everything set to manual update is because people that have things set to automatic update lose time every time they, they go onto their layout book. You only want to update drawings that you actually want to update. So people that have automatic update on, on, an, on their views that are placed on their layout sheet are losing time every single day. Um, and that's something that I've done for a very very long time as well so you don't want to lose time with that um all right any other questions or comments bearing in mind we have run long um 